This is, once again, the tower, and this will be Manos' talk on um, security-enhanced Linux virtual machines, and once again, the IRC channel for questions, if you're watching at home, is hash dc6 hyphen talks hyphen tower. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming to the workshop. Well, actually, this was initially targeted as a talk, but now that it has been repurposed as a workshop, I find that the ex audience expectations have changed. People actually seem to be able to learn something useful from a workshop, as opposed to a talk where we all just, you know, chat around on IRC all the time. So, well, in order to address this raised expectations, which was slightly frightening, I have divided this presentation into two tracks. Uh, the first track is where we actually do things, you know, build kernels. We'll be compiling two kernels during the workshop. I hope that everybody has a fast machine, uh, but we can always do it in parallel and we can continue on because there's nothing on after this except apart from our boff that starts at when? Seven? Seven. So we, if people are lagging behind, we have plenty of time to finish up and I'll be hanging around afterward to answer questions. The second part, the second track is where I try to scare the living daylights out of you about the security threats that we face on the internet nowadays and what I believe is foundational to securing our machines. Let me see if I can get this. Aha. So, the methods parts are where we build things. Did that work? That didn't work. Then, I'll, we'll go into the introduction where I talk about what kind of attacks we actually are facing. Uh, most of us who are sysadmins already know this part. We go back to building things. Then I, if you aren't scared enough by the talk of all the attacks, I try to you know, get some more rah-rah motivation in the audience. We go back to building some more things. Then I'll present the solution that this workshop is uh, trying to sell. And then we will come to building more things. And I don't know what happened here, but that shouldn't have happened. Ah, then we come to the part that is traditionally sung directly to the audience. All right, so getting started, we are going to build things. Uh, if I can get this mouse to work. So we are going to be downloading the latest version of the Linux kernel. If we don't want to go all the way to ftp.org, we I already have put this on Homer. I sent a couple of mail messages around. I hope that anybody who wanted to has already downloaded it. I have put up a couple of other uh, files in the directory which is FTP, Homer, Share, Manoj. And one of those files is called, cryptically enough, script.sh. And if you run script.sh, it will spit out all the commands that you will need to follow along. So the first one is download. The, once we download it, we will untar it in some directory out there, wherever you wish. And since we'll be building two kernel images, I always like to split out the build area into two parts. We use uh, copy minus L, so these are just hard links. So unless you are really, really short on inodes, this won't consume any more disk space than you absolutely need to. We also, the reason we are building a two images is one of the images will be on your host machine. Why can't we just use the uh, image that you already have? There is this thing called the separate kernel address space. 
We are building a UML machine, mostly because uh, demonstrating a Zen build is slightly more complex than demonstrating a UML machine. Uh, but the same techniques apply there. You want, for security's sake, to have the processes that run inside your virtual machine to be in a totally different address space from the processes that run on the host machine. That way, you, you know, there is no way that the virtual machine processes can infect your host machine. Uh, so we apply, we get and apply this patch. It is, if people want me to stop, if they're still working through this, just hold up your hand and I'll pause. Apply the SKS patch. And uh, this neat little one line invocation of busy cat, etc. is there in script.sh so that you can just cut and paste for your build. Then we just compile, configure, compile, and install. There's nothing special to be done about uh, configuring your host kernel. There is uh, one extra configure option that comes in, which is proc mm, which is uh, on by default. So if you just grab your old config, run make old config or something instead of make x config uh, and build, it's plain old vanilla make a kernel package build uh, process here. This is going to take a while. So we'll go back to talking about why we are doing all this. Everybody ready? Well, those of us who are following around. All right, introduction and attack trends. I really need. CERT has put forth a overview of recent trends in uh, computer attacks and vulnerabilities. The URL is at the bottom of the slide. The report states that attacks are getting far more automated, you know, blessings of modern technology. Used to be that uh, you would have script queries, running scripts that would scan uh, networks and computers for uh, things which were open and accessible. Then they would go in and see if they could manually, somebody would come in and try to exploit any vulnerabilities. Then it would be another manual step to try to propagate the uh, attack further. And uh, however, the trend has been that the same scripts not only scan they exploit the vulnerabilities, and they launch their own attacks, getting all the machines in the near neighborhood, which might not have been accessible from the originating point of the attacker. There are also fairly sophisticated management, um, you know, almost Tivoli-like management tools that allow you to manage all these uh, machines that you have managed to break into and exploit. Apart from automation, the attack tools are getting better. They're building in uh, anti-forensic uh, techniques. They hide from the old-fashioned detection mechanisms. They are using object-oriented techniques. You have, they are becoming modular. You can pick up an attack module, and you can pick up an exploitation module, and you can pick up a module that hides all traces and pull it together and launch an attack. They are becoming dynamic because they have this nice new plug-in architecture. They no longer have a static signature that uh, you can hold on to and scan for. Every, so the most virulent attacks, which thankfully most of them have not been released, open, out, are not out there in the wild yet, um, usually launched by various governmental agencies, are almost impossible to detect because the signature changes with every attack.
every year the vulnerability is reported to CERT double. Every year the report of vulnerabilities on a new version of a software that is released are coming out faster. The number of people who are there to defend against these attacks is not going up at the same rate. Those of us who are sysadmins will probably attest that the departmental budgets are not rising up exponentially at the same rates as the attacks are. Firewalls, there are all these, there are all kinds of new technologies that are being touted as firewall friendly, WebDAV and so on, but they actually are a way of bypassing firewall mechanisms. Firewalls are becoming more and more permeable as technologies are being deployed to get real time uh, data flow. The threat is also getting increasingly asymmetrical. It's no longer one guy out there hacking away at your firewall and trying to get it to your machine. There's probably one guy out there controlling a botnet of several thousands or tens of thousands of machines and trying to brute force his way in, simultaneously attacking you from a gazillion originating points. So any defense mechanism that looks at point of origination and tries to lock that a point of origination out is going to fail against a modern attack. Oh, ah, the infrastructure attacks. This is what gets the press, the distributed de denial of service attacks, the worms, DNS poisoning and attacks on the uh, uh, DNS root servers, uh, attacks on routers, you know, the Cisco vulnerability. This is an attack that is not specific against any particular target, but anybody who is using the internet infrastructure and Cisco routers would have been vulnerable to that. This, these kinds of attacks are becoming more and more common. I hadn't even heard of a low level attack about five to six years ago. These are the reported vulnerabilities over the, uh, since 1995 to 2005, a 10 year record. There was a drop in 2003 and 2004, I'm not sure why. Uh, maybe the dot com crash had something to do with uh, the number of machines coming on the uh, board. But the trend has been exponentially increasing. It gets worse when you look at, instead of the vulnerabilities, if you look at the incidents. In fact, the incidents are getting so bad that they stopped recording it uh, post-2004 because it no longer makes sense to record the numbers because uh, now a vulnerability comes out, a few hundred million people get infected, and the numbers at that point are meaningless. You might as well assume that a large chunk of the internet will get infected by the next successful exploit out there. And some of those people, if they are not running Linux, might be your users. All right, let's see if we can get you back. Am I going too slowly? Is my machine trying to give me a message? All right. Why does this matter? Because in order to, for us to conduct mission critical business as usual, whatever our mission might be, there are certain security goals which are common uh, or which something we should at least strive for even if we don't often achieve this. The first is authentication. This means that uh, the actor that is initiating the action being taken by the system is identified correctly and there is some assurance that this identity is not fake. Need to know who the guy is who is typing in the commands. Authorization. 
This means that the actor who is doing, initiating the actions is actually permitted to perform those actions. Me, as a regular user, should not be able to shut down Apache. I need to have specific privileges. Confidentiality means information on your machine or on your network should only be accessed by people who are authorized to do so. There is some assurance that it's not broadcast widely to anybody who just wants to be looking at it. Integrity, the same thing except that the data should not be tampered by people who are not authorized to. You know, no web defacements by some guy who managed to hack in. Domain separation. Okay, this is, it is desirable often in highly secure, uh, well, computer systems and organizations to separate out your information and your computers and your access based on different domain zones of security. You have high security areas and low security areas. Uh, payroll is probably a high security area. You don't, don't want anybody going into payroll and you know giving themselves a 3% raise every month. And uh, a wiki is likely to be a low security area. You do want people to come in and add in stuff. Presumably you do have uh, version control over there. Availability is you need to have access to computing resources for authorized users in a timely manner. When 100,000 users are hitting on your web server for any distributed denial of service attack, that is what's going missing. The bullet points in green, authorization, confidentiality, integrity, and domain separation is what I'm going to be uh, concentrating on today. Authentication is interesting, but not something that a security policy can help you with. You go into weird things like fingerprint readers and retina scanners and hopefully things that look for a pulse as well as your retina pattern. Okay. I saw some eyes beginning to glaze over, so it's time to, for a change of pace. We are back to building things. How many people are still compiling the kernel? Well, uh, it gives you better security. It makes your, it makes your machine faster. I think, I hope so. I, that code path has not often been exercised because most of us who build UML machines generally do SKS patches. But uh, it used to work. I haven't done it in six months or more, but it used to work. If you apply the SKS patch, I can assure you that it was working as of this morning on my laptop. Should, do, do you think we need a break? Do people need to ask me questions or? All right. I'm assuming that most people didn't want the hassle of actually running SE Linux on their laptops. So this is the first time I'm mentioning the SE Linux patch. We are going to be using it in our virtual machine. I happen to also run the SE Linux patch on my laptop in non-enforcing mode because I have a confession to make. Currently, the SC Linux tool chain is broken. So even though we will get a SC Linux capable virtual machine, it won't work this week. It was working three weeks ago. It was working with 2.6.15. It has not worked with 2.6.16. It will probably work with 2.6.17. And we have patches scheduled to go in into, uh, in 2.6.18. All right, so download the SC Linux patches either from there or from uh, Homer. We create yet another build directory, this time for building the UML image by again using uh, hard link tree. Apply the SC Linux patch 
as shown. And if you run that script.sh, it will spit this out for you. Now, compiling the UML, this is slightly different because the UML doesn't actually touch your hardware. It touches a fake virtual machine with fake drivers. And so you can use a really, really scaled down configuration file. There's a file on Homer which is called uml-config that has uh, what I use for my virtual machines. So you can just copy that as .config and start a second compile loading down your laptop, which is probably a good thing because that means your machine will probably be too loaded to be on IRC anymore. And once that is done, you can just install this Linux UML file that will be created. Uh, you can install this anyway, even if you have not compiled the SKS uh, com compatible kernel, because all it does is uh, creates a user bin Linux executable for you and uh, put stuff where the mo modules are. Questions? This is not a good sign. If there are no questions, that means everybody is on IRC or sleeping. God, either you guys are good. Ah. Oh, we've got more mics. Cool. You uh, using UML for this? I just wondering about the virtues of UML versus Zen for this sort of exercise. Uh, it's easier to install a, Zen, a UML machine right now in a demo. I don't have to worry about people having hypervisors and a domain zero kernel versus a DOM U kernel. The techniques, if you have a Zen virtual machine, you can skip this part. We, when we come to building the root file system, the same technique can be applied for the Zen virtual machine. The paper actually, in the conference proceedings I talk about, you could use either. I've just been using UML longer and uh, it is simpler to deploy. All you need is a user bin Linux executable out there and you've got a virtual machine that you can run. Anybody else? <laughs> this slide? The previous one to this. Okay, one more. If you go to on Homer, How am I doing on time? Uh, 4.45, so I'm half an hour into a 100 minute. I have a question from, uh, uh, from uh, Yo. Yo. <laughs> um, Yo. Is the state of SE Linux in stable good enough for him to uh, install it on his web server? Uh, the question is, what is the state of SE Linux currently instead? Well, hmm? In, well no, uh, if you're running stable, I would not recommend putting SE Linux on there. If you're running said, I would not uh, recommend putting SE Linux on any machine that you're using for anything production. Uh, until, I don't know if new has been processed, because, because prior to this last week's new processing, we were about six months behind distributions like Gentoo, Red Hat, Suze, and so on in SE Linux. Now we are at par. We've got the latest versions of all the packages in unstable, which is not to say that they are working, we have got the, but we've got the same bugs that everybody else has. I hope to be able to get this fixed once 2.6.17 comes out. 
because we need the patches are already in and we need that functionality. This I'm targeting AC Linux for Edge rather than for Sarge. I am hoping to convince enough of the powers that be with you know proper sacrifices at the proper altars to get AC Linux options in the Debian installer and as a semi-hard non-locking release goal for Edge. Uh, but right now, if you are adventurous and you want to get a you know, fresh start and be ahead of everybody else and be the cool kid on the block, SC Linux is precisely the place to be. All right. So if looking at the attacks hasn't gotten you motivated enough, and actually I haven't made my case of why SC Linux, Why do we need a defense? Well, we are getting increasingly connected to the rest of the world. A computer without a network connection is nowhere near as useful as a computer on a network. Unfortunately, attacks are trending up, as we just saw. I once put a, com a computer just outside our firewall. It was not in DNS. There were no links to it from anywhere. It was about 45 minutes before I got my first port scan. Within two hours, there had been full-fledged attacks. You know, if it was a Windows machine that was sitting outside my firewall, I would have been rooted within two hours. I don't think that this is unusual. Used to be that the guys who were attacking you were just, you know, kids sitting in their parents' basements trying to get bragging rights with their friends out there. Well, that's no longer the case. The guys who are attacking you are more li likely to be doing it for the money. I read an article a couple of months ago about the Washington Post, I believe. It was an interview with a hacker. And this guy was talking about how he gets a cool $6,000 US a month by running a bunch of botnets and uh, leasing out his botnets to people who uh, sent spam or people who wanted these machines to click through on their web uh, advertisement site. The downside of it is that the virtues of a market economy are working against us. These guys are motivated. This is what puts bread on their table. There's organized intelligence gathering out there. This happens more to companies and government agencies than to uh, you know, the Joe general user at home. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing coming out uh, at us. The people who are coming at us looking for cre credit card info for, to, to install key loggers so that they can get into our bank accounts. Uh, and they are organized. No, people are far more likely to lose their credit card information either from a bank or from the personal machine on the in internet than they are from people you know, stealing their wallets. And there are seek and destroy missions out there. And this is more likely to be a concern for the companies out there. Most of these seek and destroy uh, vulnerabilities are not actually reported as such. Uh, but there are more of them there, uh, than one would think. The other thing that's happening is that used to be you'd get broken into, people, were, the uh, guy would come in, deface your web face, and he would be out of there. You might have to reinstall your machine, but at least you knew what happened, and uh, it was a pain, but you got over it. Now your machine is likely to remain under the attacker's control for far longer, weeks or months, and it might participate in several attacks over the period on other machines 
but most of them not enough, high enough profile for it to impact you directly. Your machine might be compromised, and you, won't, you might not even know it that you're no longer in control. This is because the attackers are getting better at being sneaky and remaining undercover. There, somebody did an analysis of uh, all attacks based on uh, CERT and bug track advisories uh, since 1997 to 2005. And I'm sorry I don't have the URL up here, but uh, I will publish a modified version of my paper and it is in the references. These are just the categories of attacks. Uh, these category list doesn't actually give in number or how popular the attacks were, and I haven't been able to find a comprehensive uh, list. However, for the subcategory of web defacement, there are published numbers from zonets.org. And these are the probably the proportions of attacks vectors that they have seen in the last three years. The most likely cause of a break-in was somebody misconfigured or failed to configure at all a server. You leave the default factory uh, root server password on or uh, the next one is something you, the uh, person didn't get the patch up in time. Yeah, if you're running a Windows box, patches come every Tuesday. If you miss out on one, you are leaving your machine vulnerable. Then there were zero day vulnerabilities, things that nobody knew about. These top three attacks are what? 17 plus 12 is 29. About 44, 45% of all the attacks are just the top three. Okay. And you see how things go down. One of the things you should notice that we're talking about a web server uh, defacement. Most of the attacks that were successful were attacks against the server, the service that is being attacked. FTP server attacks and DNS server and SSH server attacks, they were some, but they are a small fraction. There is a seminal paper in security, uh, which has been published in various places over the years in uh, differing versions. It's called the inevitability of failure. The thesis here, and I believe in this, is all the security experts, all the pundits out there, all that bug track and cert are doing, are doomed to failure. They're fighting a retreating war, and they are being overwhelmed by the numbers. The mechanisms provided by mainstream OSs, and I don't just mean Windows, are inadequate. Most of the defenses that we array out there for in terms of security are things like virus scanners, firewalls. These are reactive mechanisms. They can, a virus scanner only works after you know that a virus is out there and somebody has figured out how to scan for it. If you don't know that a virus is out there yet, you're doomed to failure. The access control mechanisms provided by any operating system post Multix, and even Multix wasn't really a mainstream OS in its day, have been very weak. Usually you get two kinds of users. There is either a super user who has control of everything on the machine, or you've got an ordinary user. There are some token efforts to have power users versus non-power users, but uh, that's the most that I have seen, three levels of users. Really, if you're trying to do real solid security, you should be looking at more than the identity of the user uh, in 
making a security decision. You should be looking at the role the user is playing. You should be looking at the uh, integrity and confidentiality requirements of the data. You should be looking at how critical this action or this process is, whether you're go likely to have data loss. Just looking at, okay, this guy owns the file, let him run the command, doesn't cut it anymore. None of the mainstream operating system provides you with a trusted path. What does a trusted path mean? It means that when you run a program, when you access a resource, when you send a message across a network to somebody else, you do not have a reasonable assurance that the resource you are accessing or the message you are sending gets to the intended audience or gets you the action that you wanted with any level of assurance. People talk about cryptography as a panacea. It is not. There was a SSH attack revealed in the last month where people were sneaking credit card numbers. But it was, SSH wasn't, or SSL wasn't actually compromised. What they were doing was they had injected a Trojan that was grabbing hold of the data stream before it got encrypted and sent over the network. You have cryptography, but it was bypassed by inserting a hook either before or after the encryption stream. Actually, indeed, any general network security, if it can be bypassed, is not going to help you against the attacks that are beginning to come rolling across the internet. We have already talked about how firewalls are getting more permeable. Just plonking a firewall down at the uh, edge of your network. People have been doing that for years. It's not helping. I'm told by Wall Street that we lost several billion dollars in lost productivity because of worms this last year. OK, too many glazed eyeballs. We need to go into more interactive mode. Comments, I'm sure that there are a lot of us who are uh, sysadmins and who are running internet-facing servers. Is any of this convincing? Oh, no. We'll address that point in a minute. It's not really depressing. It's, it's depressing if you don't take any action. For people who are trying to follow this at home, I'm seeing, when I ask if this sounds convincing, I think the consensus generally was that yes, there's nothing in here that I've stated that is out of line. All right. Comments, questions, anything? What's going on on IRC? Oh, they can't see me? That's too bad. I have, I have a comment. I didn't know that uh, the uh, virus signatures are, you said they're changing now, like changing for each copy? Yeah. So they're unique, you know, because I, I use like CLAM antivirus scanner and that works pretty good for filtering mail, but if they're, you know, well, that, implement that's, something that's that was a pretty darn good solution for the 20th century. <laughs> but we are, static scanners, are not going to cut it for you. Um, I well, we saw the same thing with spam, right? Because people are doing spam checksums too, and the spammers immediately overcame those. The virus uh, people are even better at it than spam writers are. Most people who are sending out spam are send, don't have to be real smart because they send out a million emails and about 10,000 idiots respond to them and they make a profit. Virus writers, don't have that kind of a profit margin. They don't get, because in order to make a living off a botnet, you need to have at least 10,000 machines. So, and then you've got to fight for control of your botnet. 
because the next the other guy who is running his botnet would lo love to add your zombie machines to his network because the number of ma machines you control is directly correlates to the amount of money you make. Six thousand dollars U.S. tax-free a month for spending five or six hours on the computer. Heck, I spend more than that. I don't even make. Well, not tax free anyway. <laughs> okay, so coming back and looking at uh, our, our machines, what are the programs that we should be examining if we are looking to harden our machines? Well, privilege changes. Any program that starts off as root, then drops privileges and becomes something else is a potential source of uh, problems. Because the very fact that it is changing privilege, any set UID or set GID program that the user invokes, does the set UID or set GID because it has got access or privileges that the user doesn't have. Now you, if a rogue user can subvert this program that's giving me extra privileges well, heck, I've got privileges that I wasn't supposed to have just because I subverted this program. So any program that changes privileges is something that we need to be looking at. Assumption of atomicity. If there is any time interval between a security check and an action taken based on the security check, you've got a window of opportunity for the attacker. You know, removing symbolic links in slash TMP check for the file, find that it is pointing OK. Then you go ahead and remove it. The int that interval that is there is a, the window that somebody has for retargeting the symbolic link, and suddenly you have deleted, etc. password. Not a very, that's a pretty stupid attack, but still, you get the idea. If there is a window of opportunity between a check and the action taken on a check, you have a problem. Trusting the execution environment. There are programs that believe that, well, I'm the program. I must have been compiled exactly as I was designed to be. So therefore, no need to, for me to check any, do any other checking. Because since I'm executing it, I'm good enough. Or this, a corollary to this is I am a plugin infrastructure program. My plugins are obviously trusted. You know, They are my plugins. Why do I need to check? for uh, any problems with those. Any, any program that trusts the environment it is running in can be attacked by a, a hacker, a cracker, beg your pardon. Trusting user input, buffer overflow. I don't think I need to say any more. This is a newfangled, well, for old timers like me, this is a newfangled attack vector. This is mobile code, like you know, you get Java code squirted over the network from one machine to the other. Now we are getting little Ruby closures being sent across and executed somewhere else. Execu if you wouldn't trust user input, why would you trust code that's coming from somewhere else? It's handing the keys of the kingdom to, it's easier to exploit you know, code that you've written than to figure out some input that you feed into the program that will do a buffer overflow. And then you've got to be really careful what you feed after the overflow to make sure that the program execution jumps to the bad code that you have injected. And that means you need to know assembly and you need to know the computer the architecture of the processor and stuff like that. But hey, I can write a Java program that does what I want and I don't even need to know what machine it is running on. Okay, using shared resources by itself is not a security vulnerability. But if your sh any program that uses the shared resources has been compromised and can modify the shared resource, then every other program that uses this shared resource is now exposed. There's a, 
In security, the, we, there's something called information flow uh, analysis. So you start with that this domain, the information started here, it was read by that other program and it went over there. Anytime you have information flow, there's potential for compromise of anything downstream. Shared resources are one way of suddenly uh, fanning out all your information flows that went through the shared resource. Already then, we are back to building things. Networking, I mean, we have got a uh, virtual machine that we are going to have out there. We've got to network it so that data can get to it and out of it. Otherwise, you know, it's just as useless as any computer which is not on a network. Oh, I forgot. Any questions over the last bit? Comments, critiques? Am I speaking too fast, too slow? Maybe I should be telling jokes. All right. There are two ways of doing uh, networking. One is using uh, something that they call um, UML net and UML utilities. It assumes that your virtual machine is going to have a fixed IP address. It's easier to set up. Uh, you don't have to do anything special because the UML net program goes and discovers all kinds of things for you and automatically sets up things. But it means that every single UML machine you have, you need to give it a separate separate 192.168 IP address. The other method, which I kind of prefer, is uh, to set up a DHCP server for all your virtual machines. And that uses the daemon that runs and mediates packages. What you see here on the slide is how you set up UML net. The bottom line is what you give on the command line of the virtual machine when you start it up. If you've got script.sh, all of this should be there. This is uh, setting up the etc. network interfaces on the host. We set up a tap2 interface and we say that it is going to be used by UML net user. The other method, if you prefer to set up a DHCP server, I see people yawning, uh, is do that and restart the DHCP server. You're basically saying that uh, you should listen on the interface tab two. And uh, in my paper, you'll see the full DHCP config file. The, this is the other method, using the DHCP server for our, uh, you, uh, you have to run the daemon UML utilities that, the advantage of the second method of course is that you can actually set up a virtual hub. So you can have an internal virtual network of four UML machines all talking amongst themselves and talking out through a gateway which the UML utilities would, you know, it pretends to be a uh, router gateway for the external world for that internal virtual network. I don't think I'm gonna speak much more about this. Everybody knows how to set up network uh, interfaces, either static or DHCP. We have talked mostly about attacks, attack characteristics, what are the vulnerabilities that we face. Now I'm going to present what I believe is proper security solution ought to have. These are the characteristics that you absolutely need. First is privilege separation. This is so that an attack against one subsystem does not 
spread like wildfire all over your machine and take over the whole machine. So if some, somebody compromises my Apache or bind daemon, they should not get root access. This moderates any attack vector that attacks any internet facing service. Fine grained access control. We need this as opposed to you know, user group world kind of uh, access control in order to tightly control the system and yet allow it to still do what we want it to do. Nobody wants to run, and uh, hi Amaya, uh, a machine that uh, has uh, SE Linux on it and which doesn't allow their uh, FTP server to run. One of the examples of fine-grained access control is when I run my mail user agent, I want it to be able to read and write to my mailboxes. However, I do not want it to be, have access to my SSH keys. I certainly don't want it sending those SSH keys off to somebody else. Even if my mail user program has been replaced by a Trojan, fine-grained access control allows us to do that. Role-based access control. I wear several hats. There are times when I'm working on my Debian packages. There are times when I work for my day job. I work from home, so it's the same machine. However, when I'm working on my Debian packages, I don't necessarily want the stuff that I'm using to have access to stuff on my day job, some of which is not entirely unclassified. So, Changing the rights and privileges that a user has based on the role or the function they are performing currently is it reduces the, the vulnerability, the security vulnerability that you have at any given time. Least privilege. Well, don't give a user rights that he doesn't need. Don't give a role rights that it does not need to perform the function. Add in fine-grained access control and role-based security. Least privilege allows you to lock down the system without compromising what a user needs to do. You won't get very far by preventing users from what they think they need to do. You need to also limit error propagation. Nowadays, when they, somebody compromises a box, the first thing that they do is they send a, they call home and ask, wait for instructions from the attacker on some website somewhere. They attack the machines nearby on the local net, which may not be accessible directly from the outside. We need to prevent that. We need to prevent an infection of one machine or one subsystem from spreading to other subsystems and other machines. Well, you know, this seems to be kind of laboring the obvious. We don't want somebody to become root. This should be any security system we have needs to stop people from arbitrarily becoming root unless they are authorized to do so. Assurance, there has to be some assurance that the security policy that we have on this machine is complete and correct. This was strange to me before I started uh, delving in hardened systems because you know, back in the day in Unix, we didn't have secu security policies. We, you wanted to log in, you typed in guest, password guest, and you were in. So, but you can have a security policy and you can have an assurance by static analysis of the policy that your policy is complete and it is correct that there are no information flows that you did not want there on your system. I have already talked about protected paths. One of the neat things about SE Linux, this is a digression but I can't, I'm excited about this, is that you can take the concept of a firewall. You can say that, you know, in a firewall you say that I don't want 
anybody except that particular I know to be able to talk to my uh, FTP server. SC Linux takes this further. You can say that I want only somebody uh, on that particular class of machines in that security domain running in such and such a security domain itself. I only want to be able, uh, those processes to be able to talk to me. So not only can you say that this machine, you can say only a, these authorized FTP clients on those machines can talk to me. If a, somebody has broken into that machine, installed their own FTP server break-in vulnerability scanner program, they won't be able to talk to me because they're not on the authorized list. Any system that we have has to protect against zero-day vulnerabilities. We can't rely on us knowing ahead of time what the attackers are doing. We just can't stay ahead of all the, you saw the way the, the incident report went. It was an exponential curve. How many people work for IT departments or university uh, IT who can say that their department budgets and the people they are hiring is going up exponentially? Heck, we are lucky if we get a total, a one or two percent budget increase in a year in these days. Any security system we have should not be bypassed. I mean, what good is a security system if you can just bypass it? The only way you can prevent something from being bypassed is if you build it in the kernel. Anything Anything which is built on top of the operating system can be subverted. Something can slip between that security mechanism and the OS and bypass it. Given this, why security enhanced Linux? It provides us mandatory access control. What does mandatory access control do? It prevents security from being bypassed. It also gives us decent privilege separation. It gives you regulated domain transition. I told you about security domains. People have discovered that once you set up a security domain, especially if it is a large enough organization, you can't prevent people from wanting to run Windows. So you say, okay, you guys can run Windows. You are still in a top security location. What you do is you put an air gap between that network and everything outside. Even if they're running something vulnerable, as long as there's an air gap, nothing comes through. But you still need to get your information out. Or else you've got an isolated bunch of computers not connected to the network and that's no good. So this is where you do domain transition gateways. And this is where I've been trying to put Debian as a ideal platform post edge for a domain transition gateway. Uh, what this does is, say suppose you've got a document which is top secret, you want to bring it out into a merely secret or a public, open through the public area so that you can send it off to the Washington Post. The first thing that has got to happen is all the little things that make it top secret have to go away. You've got to redact it. So you set up a scrubbing pipeline. Top secret document comes in, words get deleted, replaced by black squares, and a scrub document comes out. Can't do that if somebody can just take, bypass your pipeline and just say document in, document out, let's not do the scrubbing. I know this is not very interesting to most of us out there, but I find this exciting. Protection from insider attacks. A surprisingly large number of uh, disclosure of confidential data happened with the collusion of an employee. 
fine-grained access controls, least privilege, protects you from that. It's proactive and fail-safe. It says AC Linux is denying any action by anybody by default. It's like firewalls, you deny by default. Anything you want anybody to do, you've got to put in a policy rule saying, okay, this guy is allowed to take this action. Just like firewalls, which said that, okay, we'll allow by default and deny some bad guys. Actually, I don't even remember the last time I saw a firewall like that anymore, but they used to be there, I assure you. I deployed one once. They f those are unworkable. You've got to have deny by default and you allow only things that you need. AC Linux also allows you to sandbox applications. One application cannot, if it is compromised, doesn't infect the system, cannot crash other applications. You can take AC Linux policy and statically in, uh, analyze the information flow. You can mathematically prove if program X is infected, what other programs could possibly have been compromised and may need to have their data uh, looked at and be reinstalled. All right. Okay, if AC Linux is this great, why am I here talking to you about setting up a UML machine? Well, UML and, any, and Zen actually in this case, any virtual machine gives you security in their own right. They provide strong isolation. One Zen machine or one UML machine uh, can't talk to any other Zen or UML machine on your system unless you know it comes out through your host machine and uh, goes through the network stack. This allows you to have one machine where you can have multiple virtual zones with different security, confidentiality, and integrity requirements. It would be nice if we could all deploy every one of these zones in their own big iron Debian running boxes, but you know, not all of us have huge budgets. Efficient use of hardware, I mean, this is not just a Linux virtual machine, this is any other virtual machine. Just, since no virtual machine can communicate directly with each other, or even to the host system without coming through the network stack through a pipeline that you control. This way, if you set up two different zones on two virtual machines, you've got a verifiable information flow control. You know that this machine couldn't tamper with that other machine unless it came through the host machine, which I control. You can also use these virtual machines to play around with different security policies. Actually, you might have different requirements for different machines. A BIN9 machine, uh, might you might want to put a different security policy on it than you want to put on, say, a secondary bind server, a backup bind server or something. The other thing I liked about UML, and I don't know if this is true for Zen, so somebody please correct me. Uh, UML has copy on write. That means you start with a root file system, any changes that you make, go on to the copy on write uh, file and not, and do your original f root file system is not mod modified. I don't know if you can do a Zen machine that works like that. With UnionFS? Oh, so with UnionFS, Zen does that too? Well, if you've got a uh, SE Linux Zen machine now, you with UnionFS, you can get the same benefit. You, so if something is compromised, you can roll back at least the data part to a known good state and then you know, reinstall that particular application that was compromised and you're good to go. So why else UMLs? Well, as anybody who has tried SC Linux on their machines on the desktop can tell you this is complicated. It's a fairly complex system. It's in the same class as setting up a Kerberos Realm, and I personally think it is more complicated than setting up Kerberos. This is not for the faint of heart. It will improve. By edge, it will be real good. 
Uh, policy writing is an arcane art. I've told you all the neat things that policy can do. Not very many people can actually write security policy. Uh, can you see a show of hands about how many people have experience with or actually have written MAC policies? One. Plus maybe some others from IRC. Anybody? So this is All right. The problems are made worse is that there is no really good guidelines for writing <coughs> policy. This is one of the things that uh, my research work is on, trying to figure out how to do security patterns. Uh, but there's nothing out there on it as yet. Modifying policy is almost as complex. Suppose you do have, say, policy for Apache or some other server, and the server is changed. You'd think that, okay, I've already got policy mostly written for the old behavior. It should be easy to do it for the new behavior. You know, just design by example. Problem is, you can't. Any change that you make might have repercussions that are not immediately obvious. You really have to do a full information flow analysis on the old policy, the new policy, and compare the information flow and see if you have accidentally compromised any information flow paths. Well, not that I always do it, but I'm supposed to. However, secure virtual machines are viable. You don't normally run the same things on a virtual machine that you do on your desktop. For example, I don't have FEWM or Emacs on my virtual machines, which would be unthinkable on any machine that I actually use. I don't even have Vim. <laughs> ah, the root file system. Most of the rest of the stuff was really easy, you know. Uh, it, they, they, web page out there that tells you how to uh, network your virtual machine. And uh, there are all kinds of people who have already created virtual machines and how to network them. Creating root file systems is slightly more complex. So I have created a script called createSH, createFS.sh. It is all uh, found on Homer and I'll give it a permanent well, there is, it is, there is a permanent home for it. I will send out an email for people uh, following at home. And if you have access to that script, it doesn't need any of the kernels that you have compiled or any of the networking things. You can just run it. Uh, it points to the, the, the local mirror of the uh, repo out here at devconfix and should take maybe 15, 20 minutes to run. If you had compiled your uh, UML with modules, which I didn't, so if you're using my UML config, you can skip over this part. This is the point where you can install your uh, kernel image modules inside your UML. And here is the big complicated path. I have set up a shell alias. I strongly recommend people who are using this to set up, set up shell aliases. This is how you run the UML, there is only one slight modify, couple of little modifications over regular UML uh, the regular way that you run UML and actually the uh, what I've done is I've taken the serial console, shoved it out to uh, uh, file descriptor three and I'm logging the serial console onto a file so that even if an attacker attacks my UML machine, they can't erase all logs because the logs are not there on their machine. Yeah. 
I do have three of three different examples of attacks uh, and how SC Linux can be used to moderate the effects of those attacks. But it's 5.30, I still have 20 minutes. We can use that for a question or answer session. Or I found that going through the remaining slides that I have takes about six minutes. So we can stop here, break off early and go for beer or I'd like to see an example of uh, um, one of the security policies, if that's possible. Sure. Uh, can you do it offline? Because uh, it's not going to fit on a slide. Okay. Uh, and uh, I have an example sitting here on my laptop. It's. Uh, I wish that I had, we could modify. Well, I have got it in my paper now. I have been modifying my paper after I submitted it for DebConf. I'll make it available to people as soon as I get back home and uh, polish it up and add a few more graphics. Uh, just grab me after this. Sure. Uh, one question, you, you, you said uh, several times that uh, maybe Cell Linux will be prepared for Edge. I just want to know how many people right now, Debian developers are working with Cell Linux, uh, you know, like maybe either providing the software or you know, writing uh, policies for base packages and such? I would say offhand, I know of, uh, well, there's Russell Coker, there's uh, Eric, then there is, um, Uh, oh, Greg Norris, and maybe one other person who, and I can't recall exactly who. So with myself, I know of three other people, so there's four, and uh, we would love to have other people work on this, but I, what we've been trying to do in the meantime is get these uh, SE Linux packages in uh, SID so that it is easier for people who want to play around with it to actually do so. Uh, I'll, once we get a, uh, the tool chain unbroken and have it possible for people to actually use SC Linux, maybe in a virtual machine, I'll send an email to uh, Devil Announce. We are close, and I hope to be there all the way by the end of June. Is there any utility like uh, in SysTrace to to find out which which calls are made, which files are uh, read and written that we can use to start a basic C Linux policy? Uh, yes, there is the audit uh, subsystem is now fully C Linux enabled. Once you get the, apply the patches, every action that is denied shows up in the log. Every action that is Permitted may also optionally show up in the log if you tell it to. Usually that means you've got several hundred megabytes worth of logs uh, if you'd go out, you know, highest log level, but you can filter it down. There are also tools that can take the errors that happen because SE Linux blocks something and there is a highly deprecated utility that will convert those errors into security policy allowing it. I don't recommend it because there are times when you really don't want to allow that thing. Maybe it's a bug, maybe it was an attack, and allowing somebody to automatically put in allow rules, just like in a learning firewall, you check your rules before you enable them in your firewall. Do you um, think that the SC Linux policies are going to have an effect on the design of um, executables so as to, um, you know, things that do things monolithically at the moment uh, may split up into multiple executables, the bits that do things that are secure and the bits that do things that general users want to do? Well, one thing that springs to mind is uh, GPG, for example, um, mm -hmm. can display your secret key, but it's really useful for like, 
decrypting things or yeah well i hope so but this is a chicken and egg problem at the moment people writing applications do not want to go through the hassle of uh, writing to ac linux until there is a certain level of deployment and uh, we are not quite there yet and partially because people say that none of the, my applications have been changed so do I really get that much benefit out of SC Linux. Uh, one of the things that has changed in the last three months is now we are using the reference policy which is modular. That means I can envisage Apache shipping with a Apache package policy and then Part of the post int can be here is Apache package policy, load it into the currently running policy and go on from there. Uh, but first, we have got to get SE Linux into the default system, working correctly, and with a policy that our users can live with. The way that Red Hat in Fedora has gone about it is they've created something that they call a targeted policy. That means most of the users are not impacted. Their actions are not checked by security policy. You just target a few servers. If you're running Apache, anything which is facing the internet can be targeted to be locked in a sandbox. It's not perfect hardening, but at least you have uh, locked down the applications that face the internet. Because Fedora and Suze and Gentoo and hopefully Debian are coming on board with the SE Linux, the impact on the application writers would hopefully be positive in the next year or so. Um, the, do you have a set of rules that could be used for somebody who has very little working knowledge about the computer at all? That is, uh, a set of rules that will make it easy for them to just use the computer, set the date, and do normal things, but all the protection goes on and hides in the, in the background. Security often doesn't come with no cost. We can get you part of the way there by giving something like the targeted policy. The targeted policy will not impact end users. If you do run some servers, they'll come with full security. If you want strict policy and the full security to go in the background, I think we need about a year. Right now, this is basically just, we haven't even gotten a working version in uh, Debian. I'm trying to make it so that uh, when we release Edge, you should be able to at least opt for uh, a targeted policy by default. Most likely, we will ship Edge with a Grub configuration such that SC Linux is present but turned off. You'll have to change the boot options in grub.conf. You have to turn SC Linux is equal to zero into SC Linux is equal to one. And uh, then it's up to you whether you want it enforcing, whether you just want to be warned when somebody is doing something you don't want them to do, or if your policy is not correct, or and then you can, once you're sure about your policy and you know that everybody, nobody is going to be impacted and everybody who is likely to scream at you has already been taken care of, concrete boots or otherwise, uh, then you can make the, go into Grub again and make it enforcing. A really quick question, kind of piggybacking on the previous one, if I may. Um, okay. So how do you imagine us, need, or what do you imagine us needing to change in order to be able to deploy SE Linux? Um, I mean, as you said, for Edge, we're probably going to have it uh, disabled by default, even though it will be trivially enableable. But one of the problems, as you mentioned before, is that it's extremely difficult to write policy statements. And so what needs to be changed in order for us to deploy this such that users who, uh, admittedly, from my interaction with them, have a rather difficult time even doing basic things in Debian are going to be able to set up their system and keep it working. There's a lot of work going on in the reference policy. Most of the people 
who have complained about this have been running Fedora, and Fedora was running the old NSA SC Linux policy. The new reference policy is far more modular. Uh, it's not one giant spaghetti mess with everything depending on everything else. Modular policy makes it easier to write policy. And uh, there are about a dozen people working on reference policy. It, and we are looking for volunteers. I've just become a upstream developer for reference policy just last week. Uh, and any help that we can get. So to answer your question, what we really need is people who, can, who will help us write policy and uh, get us to a stage where every package that needs something special has a little policy module for itself, and uh, which gets installed in the post -ins. We can't do it in a central uh, policy, uh, just like Fedora does. Uh, we have far more packages than Fedora does. We don't have, uh, we only have four people working on Linux now. We'll burn out if we have to write policy for 15,000 packages. So if we can pump off and dump writing policy over to the people who maintain the packages, and that will entail somebody, hopefully not me, writing up documentation on how to do policy right. <laughs> well, I figure that the, the, the people who are writing the O'Reilly books and getting paid big bucks for it ought to be doing this. All right. One question, and you almost answered that already, but. Um, I, uh, is your vision then that p uh, package maintainers write the policies for the packages that they distribute? Uh, right. Right. So how are we going to make that when the package maintainers, a lot of them at least, provide some diamonds running at root with full privileges, so without even thinking design of the package itself, how are we going to make them write security policies for those kind of packages? Well, I mean, hopefully we seed security policy which uh, policy is written by people who have experience writing security policies. Uh, for the most part, once you've got a pay package that works a certain way, the security aspects of its behavior do not change. Apache, for example, has been doing the same thing all the time. It opens a certain socket, fires off a bunch of children which communicate through the socket doing select. It reads file. Uh, configuration files from a certain directory. It writes logs to a certain directory. And this basic behavior has not actually really changed. What has changed is the what's in the uh, configuration files and how things are deployed. But as far as file accesses go and the security aspect of it, we haven't changed anything much. So I'm hoping that uh, the security policies will not have to be changed by the package maintainer. And when they do have to be changed, and if they are unsure, they come to somebody who can do it. Or if you can get, I'm hoping for some, even though I'm against helper packages uh, fundamentally, I'm hoping that we might be able to, uh, with experience, be able to create a dev helper utility that you just describe what your security needs are, you describe what kind of files belong, are log files, which kind of files are configuration files, these are the files I need to read, and um, somebody comes up and spits out a, a Linux policy for you. Uh, there are some people in MITRE who are already working, Paul Gen, uh, I think I, we already have a version of Paul Gen in Debian, uh, APOL, and there are a bunch of tools which are not quite there yet. But uh, in a year or so, and maybe if we get lucky even before we release Edge, we might have something. I'm not expecting us to have uh, distributed, distributed policy in packages at, uh, by the time we release Edge. For that, I'm hoping for Edge plus one. 
Um, are you looking at sort of a, this might be from ignorance, but are you looking at sort of a run parts type uh, um, a system for, for, the, for the policies? Or is it more of like um, a, a license thing where it's, you know, user share block? Conceptually, name, it license. is run parts. Conceptually, it is run parts. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. You don't want anybody to, you need to have proper authorization to run the, to create the new policy. There is a, a tool called SE module, which handles how module, it's kind of like the mod probe equivalent. Think about policy modules as kernel modules. Just like mod probe, there is a tool that allows you to load new policy packages and compile them and get them running in the current policy. Uh, the usual security rules apply. You don't want just about anybody to run that. You need to be sure that the policy package that you have, the module that's being loaded is in a trusted path. You know that it's being properly labeled. And, uh, but yes, it is close to, you specify a list of policy modules. There's some checking done to make sure that they are, you know, have the proper penguin P on them. And then they are loaded up into the running policy. Time's up, guys. Um, since there is no talk after this, I will contravene the little rule about everybody disappearing. If people want to hang around, I'll answer questions. If people want examples of attacks and defenses, uh, if you've got 10 minutes, we will continue after this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is the last talk in the tower. Everything else is in the hack lab. I haven't got the titles or times to hand just now but I believe there's one starting at six o'clock. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>